Okay. All right. And then if you have slides that, oh yeah, or the, uh, yep. yeah, if you could re record that screen and drag them over to that one. Oh. Yeah, just yeah. Um, share that screen. Let's see here. Uh, yeah. Um, share that one, and then share screen two. Uh, the one right above it. Um, it. Which one? It'll work. The screen two. Share the whole screen. Okay. All right. And then. Um, yeah. Pull this up. Mm -hmm. okay. There we go. And did you stop the recording? I saw it. Yep. Is it? Yep. Okay. You can move that over to this screen to get out of the way. Mm. There. there we go. <laughs> All right. Now I think I'm adjusted. Okay. Um, well, welcome. Um, thanks for joining me today to talk about C Step. Um, my name is Dr. Christina Cito Vasquez. I'm the director of the C Step program here at SUNY Oswego. Um, so I wanted to basically go over um, a description of the program. We get a lot of questions still. Um, we've actually been on campus for three years and people, um, I feel like it's the best kept secret. Um, and I obviously would love for more people to know what we're doing and what our students are doing. So my plan with this is just to make sure that as many people can get this information as possible so that they can share this with the students that are really gonna benefit from it. So program description, program requirements, um, what we're doing so you can get an idea of what we've been doing over the past three years and what our vision and mission is for the rest of our grant cycle and hopefully in a renewal for another five years. So what is CSTEP? CSTEP is the Collegiate Science and Technology Entry Program. It's a New York State Ed um, Department of Education grant program. And it's focused on increasing the number of underrepresented and socioeconomically impacted students in STEM and other licensed professions. We'll go over the eligibility for students on the next slide, but these students are either underrepresented or socioeconomically impacted. Obviously, some of these things overlap with each other, but they're one or the other. Uh, focus is on providing academic and professional support to our students. And the program returned to Sydney Oswego in 2020 after a five year hiatus. Um, it is a five year grant. And so we need to reapply every five years and between 2015 and 2020, there was no grant awarded to the school. So we return in 2020. So who qualifies? Students must be a US citizen or a permanent resident. Uh, they have to live in New York state and be a resident for more than 12 months. Um, they have to be enrolled full-time at the college. They must qualify under these demographic uh, criteria, so Black or African American, Latinx, Hispanic American, Alaskan Native, Native American, or economically disadvantaged. We base our eligibility for economic disadvantage on the same... Oops, sorry. There we go. <laughs> um, the, the income eligibility criteria is the same exact um, income eligibility for EOP. So if you're familiar with what EOP does, the, the socioeconomic piece of it is the same there. So what happens is students apply for the program and they put their application in, they do self-identify um, in whatever demographic group they're, they feel that they're in. And if they indicate that they are in a group other than what is listed here, we actually coordinate with financial aid to determine their, their um, information from their financial aid records. So we look at how many people they have in their household and how much money their household is making total. So um, that's how we make a determination on who's eligible for that demographic piece. Students need to have a GPA of 2.5 if they've been at SUNY Oswego for over a year. So if a sophomore is applying, we're looking at GPAs. If they're incoming first year students or incoming transfers and they haven't been here for at least a year, we, we give them a pass until they've had a year under their belt. A question that we often get is that if a student has a goes below a 2.5 GPA if they're no longer qualified to be in the program. So that is not the purpose of the program. The purpose of the program is to support our students. And so I do not kick out students that don't have a 2.5. What we do is we just we buckle down on them and we make them really put some extra effort into meeting with us more often, 
doing study hours, talking about strategies for success, um, just doing the extra work so that we can get them up. Most of our students that fall below 2.5 recover within a couple semesters. And so we continue to keep them in the program. And then the other piece of it, in order to qualify the program, students must be pursuing a career in STEM or in a New York State licensed profession. So the STEM obviously is pretty clear in what it is when we're talking science, technology, engineering, and math, but New York State licensures are a little more gray in what we qualify as a licensed profession. So for that reason, I don't have one set of majors at, in the program. People assume that we only have bio and chemistry majors or engineering majors. That's definitely not the case. I will say that's the vast majority of the students. However, we have philosophy students, we have sociology students, we have, um, we have a number of other students that are interested in doing things like social work, counseling, anything in the future that is gonna require some kind of license, we can qualify those students to be a part of the program as long as they meet all the criteria. Um, one of note is accounting. So I do have business students. Uh, so anybody who's interested in doing an accounting degree that has a CPA and that's professional license. So we try to offer our services to as many students as possible that can qualify. There are some that I definitely can't qualify. I've had students with broadcasting. <laughs> what did you, and I'm like, what do you want to do with broadcasting? They're like, I want to be a broadcaster. And I'm like, uh, this is not a licensed career. So unfortunately not gonna, not gonna qualify for the program. So uh, by the writ of the grant, these are the seven program requirements and I've parsed these down as much as possible. Um, we have to provide instructional support in gateway courses. Gateway courses are the courses that students are taking that can prevent them from moving on in their specific program. So this is definitely for some students more so than the liberal arts students. We're talking the math courses, the biology, the chemistry courses. So instructional support comes in the form of tutoring um, and any other support that our students ask for or require. We also provide services to enhance and increase students' involvement in research and internship opportunities. This is a big piece of this program because it is very focused on research um, and making sure students are getting experiential learning opportunities. We work really closely with Excel, our partners on campus who help us to find opportunities for students. We also get notification of a lot of uh, potential opportunities for our students um, from our listserv and CSTEP. It is a statewide program, so we're constantly getting information. Uh, a lot of our students live in the city, and so we, I often share stuff for the city for the summer and for the winter so that those students can take advantage of those programs even though they're over there and not here. Um, requirement three, so we're required to provide those student professional development opportunities, which includes things like workshops, poster presentations. Um, we encourage them to publish with their, their researchers um, and we wanna promote access to careers. So we're always trying to figure out ways where we can get these opportunities for our students. We encourage students to participate in these types of things. Um, we provide program services um, and a lot of different services and it's a lot of things that are going on on campus and obviously we lean on a lot of our campus partners to provide some of this because we are just a two and a half person um, team but tutoring academic counseling we do remedial and special summer courses we do a lot of supplemental financial assistance which I will talk more about um, recruitment academic enrichment, career planning. Um, we do reviews for licensing exams. We also do review for graduate school stuff um, and helping them with applications. We do have a day of service requirement. Um, we have to develop and implement a CSTEP advisory committee, which we have on campus. It is composed of majority uh, faculty members and staff members that work with these students. So a lot of our STEM faculty are on it, as well as um, a couple of our graduate studies programs and um, staff members. So we have like somebody from EOP, people from Excel, so a little bit all around this. So our, our committee is very diverse. Um, and then we do have to participate in statewide and regional networks. So obviously New York State has our own um, professional organization that we're a member of, as well as we meet once a month with our regional network um, here in central New York. So we're constantly connected with what's going on. So this is year three of the grant. Um, we're ending in June and year four starts in July. And I wanted to just tell you what we've been up to. So this academic year, we exceeded our roster requirements. Um, the program is funded for 100 students and we were somewhere in the 125 range on our roster. I always over enroll because I 
take into the fact that first year students change their major, people don't return after a semester, we have graduates, et cetera. So although our roster says we have 125, I would say that in terms of participation and being involved in the program is somewhere around 85, which is perfectly normal. Um, we offer a summer jumpstart program every summer. It's a week long uh, workshop. It's very similar to what EOP does, but very condensed and it's online. Um, we do often take a lot of EOP students because they meet the same demographic requirements as EOP. And so we try to not double dip into what they're already learning. But the students um, that participate, basically we're just doing a college knowledge. Um, we're just trying to get them, you know, understanding what's going on, understanding what C-STEP is and how they can use our services, getting comfortable with us. We've done faculty panels in the, the past. We've done presentations with peer mentors. So it's just an opportunity to like get students like ready to come. Um, if the students complete that week long workshop and you, what I required last year was a re just a reflection on coming to college, um, they get a hundred dollar credit at the bookstore. <coughs> so um, it's in, it, it, it benefits them to participate in more ways than one. Um, so we provide opportunities for students to attend alumni speaker events. We did online and in-person workshops, and we've also increased our internship opportunities and a lot of students involved in stuff this year, which has been great. This has been our first real year since COVID. Um, and it shows because the student attendance in our office has been increased. That also is due to a location change. We're now in Shinneman 398. Previous to that, we were sharing space with the tutoring center over in the library here. Um, the students have their own space now and they're, they feel comfortable coming to the office. And so that's a big piece of it as well. Um, so this has been a good year in terms of participation and in terms of community building, which is a part of this. Uh, we've done a lot of graduate professional schooling, uh, at, talking about options, talk, having colleges come and talk to our students about what they're offering. And we've also revamped our peer mentoring program Thanks to our graduate assistant, Cassidy Carnes, she really took the lead on creating a leadership piece of the peer mentoring program. So this is um, this past semester has been a really great different way to look at peer mentoring in terms of just instead of just pairing up students and letting up our classmen kind of figure stuff out. This gives them a little bit something a little more structure and direction. So program progress. Um, we did our service day this year. We actually participated in Maker's Madness, um, which was held in March. And our students did, uh, they created DNA bracelets with children. Um, DNA bracelets are basically the beads represent different amino acids. We had different animals and they could create their animal and make a little bracelet. It was really cute. Um, we attended for the first time ever our annual CSUF student conference. This is the first in-person one since we returned to the grant. Um, so we were limited on how many people we could bring. So um, Kristen Carell is pictured here along with me. Uh, Kristen is the PI for the grant. Um, and then we took six students with us um, and two of our students actually uh, presented posters as part of the statewide student conference. Um, and then we hold every year a CSEP showcase and CSEP showcase is an opportunity for us to give space for our students to showcase their accomplishments. Um, this year we participated in Quest as part of the Quest program. Um, Kestis really felt like it was an opportunity since there was no classes, students, you know, more people would be available, um, et cetera. And it was great. We have no problem with, with what that turned out to be. Typically we do it on our own because I like to be conscious of the fact that our students are we want them to get used to presenting. We want them to be more comfortable presenting. And so therefore we're focusing on projects at different places. So we have students that are presenting personal projects from classes. We have students who want to present it on their personal business. Um, we also have a student that, um, you know, presented stuff that's publishable. So it's all over the place, but we want to give them a space where they feel comfortable where they can do that. And so that's really the purpose of showcase and getting them used to being in front of people because we want them to continue to you know, participate in conferences. Okay, student activities. Um, so I would say like the biggest bulk of what we do is our focus on our zero credit seminar course. Um, what we do is we ask all of our CSEP students to 
sign up for it as a zero credit CAS 102 course. It's listed in the catalog as CSEP. Um, what it is, is it's in place, it's a weekly meeting. And it really is, this is the brainchild of uh, Dr. Croyle, and I give her a lot of credit for this because it is genius. By giving them a zero credit seminar, it's on their schedule. They have no reason not to attend a weekly meeting or not to participate in the program if they put it on their schedule. There's no class, you know, they should know that it's there. And I would say for the vast majority of them, they realize that. And so our students come to that zero credit seminar. It's about an hour. We basically do the important bulk of the professional development pieces there. So presentations on workshops for academic skills. We do uh, professional developments. So we did like interview techniques. We've done dress for success type stuff. We've had alumni speakers come to the college and speak to our students. Um, we do self-exploration. Uh, we have career services talk to us. Um, we build life skills. That was something we actually in integrated this year as a request from our students. They wanted more real life skills. So some things we talked about were like financial literacy and how to save and what you do with your money, where, do, where does taxes go? Um, and we also talked about like rental agreements. So just some real life skills that they're gonna use as they continue to move forward to graduation. And then of course our community building, um, which is, I feel the backbone of this program. Um, our students are 60% African-American, 39% Latino and 1% other. And um, there's a lot of comfort and power in coming into a classroom when everybody looks like you. And so a big piece of this is this community that they built themselves. Like I, I provide the space, they build the community and they have taken that and run with that um, to the point that we actually created a student advisory board that their positions are focused on social and community building. And what they do is just provide like opportunities for students to get together outside of our regular weekly stuff. So um, on the previous slide, there was a bonfire. They created that. They also helped us with our end of year celebration. Um, we've done paint nights. We've done just a variety of things so students can get together outside of the classroom. So student support, that is the wrong picture. Um, I thought I put a different picture in there. Uh, so summer jumpstart program, um, that which I discussed earlier, our math and radiation classes for incoming freshmen. So part of what we do is when our incoming freshmen come in, we check their Alex scores and students that are close to jumping into the next um, math section, we will reach out to them and ask them what we can do to support them. So we let them know how to work through the Alex modules for remediation. We also offer tutoring and we can pay tutors outside of OLS to actually tutor those students one-on-one -on -one if they ask for it. Um, we talked about bookstore stipends. Um, student stipends, this is our financial assistance for our students. Um, I have all of these different stipend programs and I give a lot of money away. And so you'll hear our students say, oh, CSTEP paid for this or CSTEP did this. Um, because the purpose of our money, uh, they really encourage us to get it to our students in their hands. And so when I pay a stipend, it goes directly to the students. It's direct deposits to their bank account and they pay their bills. They pay for whatever it is that they need. So some things I've paid for are rent, cell phone was gonna get turned off, needs money for a cell phone bill. Um, parents are sick and need to make an emergency trip home. So transportation between spring break and winter break. Those types of things are things I've paid for. I've also paid for grad school visits. I've paid for grad school application fees. I paid for students to take their GRE and their MCATs. Um, any additional financial obstacles? You know, rent is one that always comes up. Um, something happens, their financial situation falls out and they need help or they're in a situation where they need to get out of a rental and into a new one and that's incredibly costly. I also pay students for participation in internships. So if they need money for transportation, they need money for food. Um, last year I was paying for our education students Uber trips back from Syracuse because they couldn't get the van to pick them up but only drop them off. And so that's $100 each time. Um, and so I was giving them money so that they could get a ride home. Um, and any other emergencies that come up or anything that doesn't fall in these other categories is what I tell students. I've also paid, this year has been a kind of a unique year. Um, we didn't have staff for 
a good portion of the year. Um, we just hired our assistant director, Dr. Stephanie Wallace, and then Maddie Wallace is our assist administrative assistant. Um, and they're paid out of the grant. And because of that, there's a lot of money left over in unpaid salary. And so we are, we do have the ability to move that money. And so we, we moved it over into student stipends. So I've been giving a lot of money away this year for things that I probably wouldn't usually give away money for it's things like summer classes. So I've paid for some student summer courses. Um, I also am helping students who are traveling abroad. So helping them to figure out their expenses outside of tuition. The purpose of the program is not to pay tuition. This is not a scholarship program. The purpose of the money that we get to our students is really to offset the costs that are outside of the regular bill. Um, and then the other stipends we have are research stipends. So students participate in research, get $250 each semester that they participate in research. Again, that's to offset the fact that they're not working, they're working in the lab. Um, we do reward students that do outstanding service to so those people that are involved in the community, whether on campus or off campus. Um, students that mentor other students get paid. Um, showcase, we, in another way to encourage students to participate in our showcase because they're so shy, is to pay them. So we always tell them that we will give you a showcase stipend. Um, and then our bookstore stipends for the summer jumpstart, but we also offer regular bookstore stipends for students every semester. Um, it is a limited number. We do about 20 first time first serve. Um, and then if students need additional help, of course they can apply for stipend and we can do them something else. Okay, so as we end year three and then go into uh, year four, we are hoping to do more, especially now that we're fully staffed. Um, so one thing is focusing on more participation in conferences for our students, whether at the local and regional or even the national level. Um, we want to provide additional learning opportunities for them for their certifications, uh, advanced training opportunities. We've been looking at eCornell a lot for specific programs and helping students with like getting into just some workforce kind of certificate programs. Um, increasing the number of students that engage in research and internships. We, every semester, we focus on making sure these students are getting these experiential learning opportunities and just getting them to apply is sometimes really, really difficult. So we wanna to continue to make that something that's normal for them. Um, let students just feel like they're not ready. They're not good enough. Um, I'm in this field, what research am I gonna do? And you know, letting them know that there's research opportunities in every single field um, has really been a big thing. So um, we wanna continue our expansion of our partner network here on campus and um, through our alumni networks. Um, we are very fortunate that we get a lot of support from the campus, uh, counseling, a lot of other, you know, our OLS partners. They, um, they help us out by providing workshops or even just providing information on services is really great. And then um, love to look at other grant opportunities for our students to see if we can provide additional funding for them to get out and do those things like research and get to graduate school and get professional opportunities that they're not getting now. And then our vision for the future. Um, program growth has dictated that a larger program can be sustained. When the grant was originally written for 100 students, that was a stretch. Um, and so what we found every year is that as the program continues to grow, students go and talk to their friends about the program, they talk to other people, they let people know how great the program is, and then we get more interest. This year, I haven't even opened applications to first year students yet, and I have over 65 continuing student applications. And so, um, which speaks to me in terms of the fact that we can sustain a larger program. Um, the grant can be written up to like 300 students. Um, Buffalo is probably one of the biggest programs in the state and that's basically what they're, they're carrying. Um, more students, more money, which is always a good thing. Um, so that's kind of our hope in the future. Obviously additional programs that maybe can support CSUP students in different ways. And then um, we would love to see the expansion of our physical space. We have our Shemin 398 office is actually the old math department office. So it's got a giant round desk in it. My office is in there. It's great it's space it's ours and we love it um it is cramped we have a lot of chairs in there um and at any given day if you walk by our office um you'll see anywhere from like six to ten students hanging out 
Um, we pay a lot of them, they're student workers. <laughs> so they're there, but their friends are there. They're chatting, they're studying, they're talking about classes um, and it's their space. And it would just be nice to have more space for them to feel comfortable to be able to hold study groups and do things like that. So um, additionally, and I didn't mention in our services, one thing I do wanna mention is that we do borrow equipment to our students. So one of the biggest ones is calculators. We, every semester we can borrow a student, uh, one of our calculators, we have like every single, I don't even know what all of them do. Scientific calculators all the way to like, there's really fancy graphic ones. Um, we also have Chromebooks. So if a student has a class and their, their, you know, their laptop died, they need to borrow a laptop. I've lent them out for the semester before. Um, whatever they need, we wanna make sure that we're providing those things for them. So those are additional supports that we offer. Um, I could talk on and on about what our students are doing. Um, this year, we've had several more graduates. Obviously, as we're coming out of COVID, we're seeing our graduate classes um, growing. And I have students going on to doing a number of different things, graduate programs. We have one student who is going to University of California, I'm gonna say Berkeley, but I think it's at UCLA. Um, and he's going to study computer engineering there in a graduate program. Um, we have students going on to medical school. We have students that are moving on to nursing school. We have students that are doing grad programs here. Um, and if they decide to do a graduate program here and they wanna to continue to participate, we do welcome them because uh, there is no limitation. It's only for undergraduate students. Um, I was gonna ask, do you have numbers on the students that graduate and them going on to? So yes, um, alumni tracking is really difficult. Mm -hmm. That is probably our, our, our hardest um, Same kind of, yeah, right. exactly. Um, because it's self-reported, right? Yeah. So unless you lose, use the clearinghouse and like check enrollments and things yeah. like that, um, continually it's, it's hard. But what I do is I've actually go through a couple times a year and I go into LinkedIn and, <laughs> yeah. and I look at, way. yeah, exactly. And I see what the students are doing and see what they're up to. I would say probably like 40% of our students go on to grad school right That's after. Right. Um, our graduate classes have been increasing as I mentioned. Our first year we graduated seven students. Our second year, you know, it was like maybe 10. This year has definitely been our biggest class. I think we were what, 30? Yeah, so 30 students graduate. This is, these are the students that have been with me the longest. They've been with me all three years of the grant. So these are the ones that I've had since fledgling pieces of the, the grant and um, they're going on to a number of things. We've done a lot of actually post-graduation talks with students about grad school and what's next and what are your next steps in terms of getting a job. Um, and I would say probably it's about 50-50. Students have plans for grad school and then the other 50% are really looking for jobs and seeing what they can do. So that's, you know, our students are awesome. Um, so just a couple pictures of, you know, things that happened just this year. Um, so we do stoles for our graduates. So if you're ever at commencement and you see these green stoles with the yellow writing, those are C-step stoles. Um, so when we did our end of year celebration, we invited obviously everybody and we present those stoles to our students. So um, this is a small group of them. Um, the students up at the top of the paintings, that's from our annual conference that we attended. And these two students in the bottom with the picture of me are our two presenters. They actually presented at the poster showcase at the CSEP annual conference and one of our graduates up there in the corner. So um, like I said, I could talk forever about the things that we're doing and our students, but if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer um, about the program, about our students, about what our plans are, et cetera. I have another one for you. Sure. I'm curious and, and interested about the zero credit seminar. So what is the outcome of that? Do you see that a lot of the students attend knowing that it is zero credit? It seems like there's a lot of camaraderie and sense of belonging within this group of um, students. So I was wondering, what does that look like? Is there, you know, knowing that it's zero credit, do you see a lot of them attending it regularly? Um, because it kind of gives me an idea even in our department, you know, right. having it on their schedule is a great idea to kind of have that. Right. It, the, the scheduling piece obviously provides a little bit of accountability. Mm -hmm. We see our, much like all classes, mm -hmm. fall attendance is at its highest. So mm -hmm. that's where we see the vast majority of the students attend. Um, I did mention early on that we do online. Mm -hmm. So we do have students that have um, class 
you know, obligations on Fridays, a lot of labs meet on Fridays. So it, there are students who cannot attend. And so we actually offer in addition to the in-person on Friday, two additional alternative meetings, which meet online. Um, and our graduate assistant runs those. Those are much more intimate. There are like five students, six students that show up at a time. Um, but those students actually, they regularly attend because they have created their own bond and community in a small group um, with Cassidy. And she does a wonderful job. Um, I would say that our, in the very beginning, we're probably like 90%. So I think my cap, the cap on the class is somewhere around 50 um, or 60. And so we'll see, you know, 50 people show up pretty regularly for a month. And then it starts to taper off. But that is also indicative of like every other class. Right. Um, and also changes yeah. the students are making. They're changing their schedule. They're right. discovering that they don't want to be a bio major, yeah. you know, or you know, there, there, there are students, you know, we have, uh, it's very rare where you have students that just don't benefit from being a part of the program. And it's, a lot of it is based on, you know, individual students and what they're seeking. Um, for some students, they don't need the additional support. So for them, it's, they see it as like an additional commitment. Mm -hmm. And so for them, they will leave the program. But I will say that our participation, generally speaking, is probably somewhere around 80% um, for the program, um, which is incredibly high compared to other programs. Mm -hmm. um, I went to the annual conference and talked to other programs and like 20% wow. is like a good day for them. So, and I, I do give a lot of that to that zero credit seminar because right. the accountability is built into right. it. And so like, I will have students email me right. and tell me they're not coming to class. And I'm like, okay, you know, they're not getting graded on attendance. They're not getting, I don't take attendance. I don't, you know, you're there. I know who's there and I know who's not right. there. Um, so it's a way for them to meet and see. Everybody. Exactly. You know, okay. And they seem to really enjoy the workshops and they seem to really enjoy what we're presenting to them. They mm -hmm. find it helpful. Um, generally speaking, they're, it's useful. Yeah. There's always opportunity for them to ask questions and to um, kind of get access to services and support that maybe they wouldn't have access before right. or even known about. Every year is a surprise to me how many students have never been in career services. Yeah. So bringing in career services every year, even though I have students who have been in the program for four years starting next year and they've seen it all before, how many of them have actually gone? So just continuing to do those regular things with them has benefited. Um, have the students ever um, give recommendations about kind of like what they want to see mm -hmm. in those seminars? Like we assess every semester and part of what we ask is like, give us feedback on what you want. And that's where we integrated those life skills lessons. Yeah, um, exactly. yeah into what we usually do. A lot of what I usually focus on is professional development pieces. So I look at like Excel, um, talking about internships, talking about grad school, um, career services, talking about what, career opportunities are going to present themselves afterwards, um, as well as things like academic self-advocacy, you know, study skill. These are things I do every semester with our students and um, making sure that they know how to do things because, uh, you know, I, I'm a first generation college student. Um, the vast majority of our students are first generation as well. And I often talk about how the language of college is very different than any other place. We speak a whole language, all our own. And many of them don't understand. And so taking opportunities to just break things down for them so they have a better understanding of how to access things is like, I think the most important part of this program. Um, our students need, this population especially, needs someone to talk to them the way that will help them to understand the things that they don't understand. And that's kind of, I feel like my role in this program has been over the last three years is to be that person, to provide opportunities so that they can talk to a person like, and not get jargon. You know, somebody who can just break it down and just be like, this is what you need to do. Like, I'm having trouble with my professor. Tell me what's happening. Okay, so here's your course of action. This is what you can do. This, you can talk to your professor. You can do this. You can, if you feel that this is egregious, uh, you can go to your department chair. If you don't feel comfortable with the department chair, the dean isn't. So talking to them about the way that we do business mm -hmm. um, so that they can advocate for themselves and do the things that, so that they can be successful. Um, so I think that that's, all. I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one appointments with students. Like we're getting ready next week is our first site visit from NYSED. So we're a little nervous about that. Mm -hmm. um, but 
talking about how many hours I meet with students and how many things I do, like I don't even think I can quantify it because the door is open. So students plop in on my couch and, you know, spill everything. And like, I know so much about these students and the things that they're facing and experiencing. And I think a lot of, it would be eye-opening for a lot of people to understand the obstacles that these students face just trying to get from one year to the next to finish school. So it's, um, it's very rewarding work. We love these students. They're wonderful. They're going on to do amazing things and we're so proud of them. And I think that's why I love working in this program so much because the students really make it worthwhile. So um, we hope that in the next five years, this will be a continued growth program for our students so we can provide even more services for more people. In the professional development, do you talk to the students about things like retrieval practice, face practice, and fully practice in terms of effective learning strategies? So we um, focus a lot on some of the basic skills that I, because I used to teach EDU 104. Um, so some of those basic mindset slash, um, growth mindset, yeah. yeah, growth mindset is a big one that we talk about. Um, and different form, like I very cognizant that like students learn differently, you know, they all have ability to learn, but everybody kind of, you know, processes in a different way. So we talk a little bit like different things you can do to help you but you, but obviously practicing and needing to find those things on your own. Um, a lot of times those conversations are with students one-on-one -on -one where we talk about how do you learn? Like, how do you like to study? Is it actually working for you? Because, you know, is it actually doing anything for you? Um, do you find distractions here? Do you need to be here? Do you need quiet space? Do you need loud space? Um, are you comfortable in your dorm room? Do you need to be somewhere else? So really that's, I think those conversations become more, personal on those one-on-one, especially with the students that are struggling. Um, and then offering the resources on campus to help them, making sure that they know how to make appointments with tutoring, make sure they know how to access office hours for their professors um, mm -hmm. and things like that. And those are all good, mm -hmm. but you know, there's a lot of research suggesting that the way students study are not consistent with how we learn. And, mm -hmm. You know, that in general, the things that are most beneficial are the things that students tend to avoid the most in terms of those issues, particularly retrieval practice, space practice, and right. practice. And when there are interventions where students use those, there's very significant improvements in student success. That it may be something worth considering. Yeah, absolutely. Love to learn more about that. Um, we're continually adding to what we, we provide for the students. We backed off of the academic skills a little bit this year um, because our students are returning and they are requesting not to have the same um, things, but we do offer um, a lot of one-on-one -on -one opportunities to talk to students about what they're doing. Um, I think the big thing is connecting dots for them. Um, so I do a lot of that more so than like, you know, I don't tutor or do anything specific like that, um, but saying, you know, here are the people that can help you. Here are the people that should be helping you. Here are the people that you need to go to to actually figure out what's going to work for you um, and making this connection. And then offering up, obviously, like uh, courses, you know, like letting them know that these courses are available, the GST courses and EU courses, so that if they do need the extra boost or they eat, need the extra help, there's, there's a course there that can help them. Are there any questions from people online? This yeah, just... hi, folks. Uh, thank, thanks for the great presentation and, and the work that you're doing. Um, I, uh, I have to admit that I, I felt like your description of this being a best kept secret or something was kind of uh, apt because I, I feel like I've only recently found out about C-STEP and only through word of mouth. And I've sort of been like, wow, I wish I knew this was happening you know, sooner. So I guess in, in, that, um, in that vein, I don't know if you've thought about, I don't know, I guess I'm curious how you reach out to students uh, because partly how I found out is that I had students <clears throat> who I knew about who were excelling in our department. I'm in biological sciences, by the way. And um, I had some students <clears throat> come in and speak to my seminar, my freshman seminar classes, just to kind of, you know, give basically give pep talks to the freshman seminar students. And one of them was like, C-step, C-step, this is great. And I'm like, wow, what's C-step? Uh, so I guess... Um, you know, now that I know about it, I can pitch it to my freshman seminar classes myself. 
Um, but I don't know if, if you also have some sort of outreach you do to faculty in STEM. I mean, maybe I missed an email or something that you sent to us, but um, just like a, a one pager on like, okay, this is what C-STEP is, refer X, Y, and Z students to us uh, would be, I think, a great way to, you know, give some tools to faculty who are, we're always looking at how can we help students, right? I mean, that's, right. I rack my brain about this all the time when I have students who are struggling is like, you know, and it seems like one of the things your program does really well is, um, is a really kind of hands-on working with individuals, right? Like you said, mm -hmm. in a very personalized fashion. Um, so so um, I think the hardest thing for us was we started our program in the middle of COVID. Um, and I think that that has really been the hardest part about getting the word out. So we started the program, um, I came on board as an interim director in like September of 2020. So we're talking the height of the pandemic. Um, I initially, uh, Kristen had sent out a number of emails to students that qualify based on demographic that were already enrolled in the school. So they pulled information, information from institutional research to see who would qualify based on the very basics of our criteria. And so that email went out, we encouraged students to apply. So we got, you know, a handful of students from that. I then, my main role when I came on was recruitment. And so I went to Alana and I did a presentation for that group. Um, I reached out to a number of our organizations on campus for STEM. So, you know, I went through all the organizations that are in Laker Life and emailed and said, this is a program that we have. If you're interested, you know, let me know. I can answer questions or just apply and let us take a look and see if you're eligible. So it was a lot of scrapping our first semester in the program. So by December, I had about 95 students that were eligible for the program. Um, in order to be in good standing with the grant, we need to have 95% of what we said we're gonna have. So that was our number. Um, the, as the January came, um, working with the first year advising group and letting them know about the program and trying to recruit students that were coming in that way. So it was just a really hard time trying to get things going through COVID. Um, I think that, I think the challenges in the program have been mostly like staffing. So a lot of it has been me for the vast majority of this. And so when me, the only person doing it, I'm also doing all of the academic stuff. I'm also doing all of the classes. I'm also making sure that all the program pieces are working. And so there are things that fall to the wayside and recruitment is definitely one, or I don't wanna say recruitment because we've always, we've always maintained our roster. Um, I would say getting out and telling people what we're doing has been my biggest obstacle and my biggest challenge because um, unfortunately it is a little bit of a vacuum um, because the population is just, it's small, um, it's very specific and letting people know what our students are doing sometimes it's not the easiest thing in the world because I have to, you know, you gotta, you gotta really have a lot of foresight into thinking about putting things out into the newsletter and putting things out into, you know, announcements and things like that. Um, so what I did last year for first year students in answer to that question, um, I was a first year advisor before I actually came into this role and I still have access to all the information in there. So I actually pulled every single first year student's email and I sent like 2000 emails last summer, <laughs> um, letting people know about the program. And I said, if you think you qualify, if you're not sure, if you have questions, please just ask, but moreover, just apply. Because it's easier for me to determine your eligibility than it is for you to determine your eligibility. And I got a number of email um, responses and also applications that came in that way. And we filled our roster with those um, for sure students. But I did talk to, um, this was actually a part of discussion in the class leadership meeting last time I was there about how do I get the word out to people? Um, and so a suggestion was made to actually send the information to department chairs and then have department chairs disseminate that information to their professors. Um, so that's the plan for the summer to let people know that we have this program, it's here, please share with your students. Um, and of course, forward any questions to me. I think um, what happens is, is, I think a lot of professors mean well, and they get really stuck in the eligibility requirements of things. And they're like, oh, I wanna suggest these students, but I don't think they qualify based on X, Y, or Z. And I'm like, I just put their, have them do an application because let me be the one to determine their, 
their eligibility, but there, there are, we do have campus partners that are putting that information out there. I just would love to get the word out to everybody about all the amazing things that we're doing. Um, and I don't want it to be a secret anymore. I want everybody to know what CSTEP is doing and what our students are up to, so. Sure. <laughs> that sounds great. Um, if I don't, if you don't mind me asking a quick follow up there. So sure. um, is there going to be like a timeline <clears throat> now that you have like a number of students uh, who are continuing, right? You're going to obviously, you, you might get to a point where you have to be a little selective. I don't know if that will happen in terms of uh, the people coming in. Is there going to be sort of a timeline for applying? Or if I have students who come into my uh, freshman seminar courses in the fall and you know, it's a few weeks into the semester. I don't know, uh, what, what's the plan? For yeah, that? that's a really good question. Um, we typically give about a month into the semester. Um, after a month, month and a half or so, I'm like, listen, you might just wait until spring um, or you may as well just wait until the fall to put your application in because it's a little too late to, and the registrar gets a little testy when I start adding people into courses that late into the semester. Um, you know, so yes, I, I will take people after the first, you know, call, we'll, we'll actually still be recruiting into the first couple of weeks of school. So um, yeah, if you find somebody in your seminar or you wanna announce that to your seminar course within the first couple of weeks, we absolutely will take applications. Great. Um, so last slide is just um, our contact information. So as I said, I'm the director and then Stephanie Wallace is our new assistant director and then Maddie Wallace, our admin. Um, we do have an Instagram page. So if you are social media adept, um, please follow us on Instagram. Um, that's actually student run and our students are the one who update that. They put the pictures up and they make the announcements. So um, I asked them to do that because I told them I'm old and I don't Instagram good. So um, yeah, so thank you so much for coming today and talking to us about CSUP and listening to what our students are doing. I'm always happy to answer questions. Um, if you ever have anything come up with a student that you're just not sure if they qualify or if they're interested or, or if, you know, if they would benefit from the program, just send them my way. I'm happy to talk to them. Okay. All right, and I just hit. Yes, yeah, stop the recording. Okay, thank you.